Grace and peace to each of you this morning, and we welcome each of you to this 172nd celebration of the Edict of Emancipation. And we invite all of you, as we have communion later on, to um, take the communion as it's given to you. We will have, uh, the, as tradition in our church, the outer rings are wine, there is red, and the inner rings are white grape juice. This coming Sunday, there will be the election of two officers to fulfill two unexpired terms. One is for Renee Gravel after her death. She had just started, so Debbie Garou will be, is being nominated for the class of 2022, and we'll vote on her. And the second is for Alan Griffin um, to fulfill a one-year unexpired term for Mary Barstow. And that is for uh, the role of deacon. This uh, coming Tuesday night, the Symbols of the South uh, series, the second in the series, Dr. Cameron Lifford is a sociologist from Appalachian State. And he will be presenting his program on how the, uh, the flag and the monuments have been reinterpreted down through the ages. and how that's perceived by different groups within our, our society today. It should be a very interesting program and you're invited to attend at 7 p.m. at Western Piedmont Community College in the Leviton Auditorium. Thursday night of this week, men come out. We're going to have a fellowship dinner um, at, is it 5 or 5.30? Um, it's listed for 5.30 p.m. So come out for that, and we will uh, gather together and enjoy the fellowship and time together with each other. Now let us prepare our hearts for the worship of God.
Happy are those whose footsteps follow the way of the Lord. The path of justice and mercy that draws us toward holiness. Happy are those whose hearts delight in the law of the Lord. Happy are our souls when we gather to worship the living Lord. if we say we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is merciful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. In confidence, then, let us join together in the prayer of confession. God of steadfast love, how often do we utter careless words that humiliate or harm? How often do we lash out in anger when we could reach out with kindness? How often do we hurt those we love and tear away at relationships that give life? Forgive us, we pray, in your abundant mercy. Give us the grace to confess our faults, to seek forgiveness, and to work for reconciliation in our homes and in our communities. Turn our hearts back to you and teach us the ways of love so that we might hold fast to one another and draw near to your presence. Take a moment of silent confession. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things unseen. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. 
We can therefore look forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. For by faith in Jesus, the cornerstone, we are all forgiven. Amen. Good morning. Oh, you know what? The choir's curious. I can tell. I can tell. All right. So this morning, I'm going to say, okay, Carla. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> uh, this morning, I'm going to set before you the potential for life and death. Here we go. You ready? You see that? Does that grass look like it's alive or dead? Alive. alive. But you know what? Guess what? This is dead grass. Might as well be. That's dead grass right there. You know why? Because of where I found it growing. All the rain has made, made it to where there's some stuff that's sprouting. But that grass was growing right in a place where on my driveway, as soon as it starts drying out, guess what's going to happen? What? It's going to die. That's right. It's going to get run over. It's going to get run over. It's going to die, right? So I saved it. I, I pulled it from the place it was in, and I said, that is dead grass. And then I grabbed it, and I said, but you know what? If we put this in the right place, this will be what kind of grass? Alive. It will be living, living grass. You have grass? Yes. We all have grass. 
And so, listen, today in the scripture, we're listening to God say, we're listening to God say that if you will live the way that I have commanded that you live, then you will be like living people. But if you do not live the way I've commanded that you live, then you will be like dead people almost. But, but you know, you could look at, that's right, you could look at this grass and you could say, this grass is not dead. But then if I said, oh, but it will be in a few days, you would understand, right? When we hear Jesus say, if you follow me, you will enter into life. But those who do not follow me are dead already. Well, the people would look over and they would say, they're not dead, Jesus. They're standing right there. But Jesus understood, Jesus understood that if we don't live the way God would have us, that we're kind of like this grass. We're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Right? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we are able to understand the way you would have us live just by looking at simple things that you've created. And when we look at these children... They seem simple, but they are so beautiful, and they teach us so much uh, in our presence. Lord, we thank you for them. We ask that even at this early age that they would understand that to live abundantly means to live as your people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. we come to the time of our pastoral concerns this morning, I learned on Thursday afternoon that Katie Gravel Stillwell's father-in-law, Scott Stillwell's father, 
died of a stroke on Thursday, and this is the second death for them of one of their parents in the last two or three, or within the last month. So we keep them in our prayers. We also want to lift up Jane Lane's family, who was buried on Friday, and the family of Jill Fletcher in her death a couple of weeks ago. Lift, we lift up Spotswood and Peggy Neal this morning, and uh, Spotswood is, um, seems to be at a, a, at a stable place, but very weak at this point. And then Don Waldrop, Gunnar Harbison, Ed Blaynott, and Harvey Jones are battling cancer. We lift up Matt Jones, Harvey's son, who's recovering from a stroke, and uh, Betty Garou for continued health issues in her life. Are there other pastoral concerns that any of you all know of that we should lift up? Kevin? Yes. We want to give thanks that Harvey is here to sing with us. Yes. First time in a while. Welcome back, Harvey. How far along are you in your chemotherapy at this point? Okay. So, but everything's fine. Our prayers are with you and your family, particularly with Matt, too. Let us join together in prayer. Lord, we claim our role with you as people of faith. For you have been the guiding source, guiding light of the Waldensian people for 850 years. You have led them, Lord, through very, very difficult times and guided them along the way so that we, this day, could worship here and reflect on the history and reflect on the joy of being your people. We thank you, Lord, for your providential care and love which has sustained this community of faith since its inception in 1893 that has sustained the Waldensian people for throughout all of the generations. We ask, Lord, as a Waldensian and a Presbyterian church that you will be with us this day, strengthen us in our service and our love for you and for each other. Strengthen us in our devotion that we are faithful stewards in reaching out to our neighbors. And strengthen us, O oh Lord, in the walk that we have that is set before us in the future. We ask your blessing now to be with those who grieve, those who have lost loved ones in the past month, and those who've lost loved ones in the past year and even longer that are still grieving. We ask your comforting presence to each of them. We thank you, Lord, for the abundance of life that you've given us that we share in this congregation. And we ask your continued direction to lead us into the future that you have set before us. Now we offer our prayers of gratitude and thanksgiving for the many blessings that you've given, particularly for the gift of health. And we pray health for those that we've mentioned this day and others on our hearts. Hear us, O oh Lord, as we join together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, Clara. That was perfect for the sermon today. As we come to the reading of God's word, first let us turn to God in prayer. Open us anew, O Lord, to your truth, that we may hear it, that we may be inspired by it, and that our lives be transformed as faithful witnesses in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, starting with the 15th verse. See, I've set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord, your God, that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways and observing his commandments, decrees and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you will perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to you, to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. This is the word of the Lord. See, I set before you this day life and prosperity, death, and adversity. So said the leader Moses to the people of God as they found themselves at the end of a long 40-year sojourn in the wilderness. Moses laid out a choice, two paths, choose your path. To take the next step meant that they had to make a choice. One path would lead to a future well-being and prosperity the other to hardship, adversity, and death. One path would require obedience and devotion of their lives to God and to God's calling in their lives, while the other path appeared easier at the beginning because they really didn't have to do anything other than serve themselves. But such a path was fraught with peril. By turning their backs on God, they would turn their backs on the one life force that they as a people could count on. If they chose to worship other gods, they would indulge their own individual interests and find themselves at odds with each other and with God. The end result of following one path would lead to abundant living, while the other path to chaos and self-destruction. In both cases, Moses publicly acknowledged the choices laid before them would lead them into a future without him. He knew he was at near the end of his life, and they would have to cross over under new leadership. Either choice they made, his absence in their lives would bring about substantial changes to them. Today, we have a real advantage over the original audience who heard this sermon of Moses. For we have seen the following chapters in the books of the story of the Hebrew people, and we know what happens. We can recognize the consequences in their lives when they made the wrong choices, and as a people turned their backs on God and engaged in self-serving behavior. Self-indulgence led to worshiping the false gods of Baal and Ashtart, and at one point even sacrificing their own children to idols, of turning their backs to each other, especially on the poor in the community. The Hebrew people lost their homeland 
their relationship with God, their autonomy as a nation, and their independence as a people. And they ended up at part of their lives in that journey in slavery and exile in Assyria and Babylon. See, I said before you, life and prosperity, death and adversity. Sometimes they got it wrong, and sometimes they got it right. We see it, and we understand it, looking backwards, but it's harder sometimes to discern the same issues in our own lives. Transition brings choices, and with those choices come consequences. I believe that this passage provides us with an essential perspective on the historical day of our identity as a Waldensian Presbyterian community. We find ourselves in a transition. Remember how it was about 35 years ago when church participation played a more prominent role in the lives of this community? Today it's a time more of numerous distractions and alternatives. Some of those we have to make. Swim meets, soccer tournaments, binge TV watching, amusement parks, and so on, and of course the golf course. I recognize that being here on a Sunday morning is a choice that you've made, and I'm grateful that you make this commitment to worship and that is a priority in your life. When I arrived here 12 years ago, we were averaging about 175 to 180 in worship on a given Sunday. In sharp contrast to that point, we were also having one child come forward for children's time. Since then, this congregation has lost 120 plus members to death. Few others have drifted away. But on a positive note, we've seen the number of young families in this church increase, and today, as you saw this morning, 10 to 15 kids as an average. So we see life coming into us, and that is not by accident. It is by purpose and choice, and the choices and decisions that this congregation made over the last decade. Our children recognize here that they are valued. They are worship leaders. They will also engage in singing. And we will hear them just in a few weeks time with the Girl Scouts singing and leading us in worship. Choosing to emphasize our children in this congregation has given us a path to life. And yet today, our average attendance between our two worship services is around 130. <clears throat> Change is a constant. It's in human life and in the life of our own faith community. And this passage from Deuteronomy reminds us that if we stay grounded in our relationship with God, then God will be faithful to us. We can count on that. And we, like God's people of every generation, have a multitude of choices to make. We can either embrace the changes that are coming to Valdez and to our own lives, or we can resist them. Back in 1957, a Waldensian visitor to the Rio de la Plata Waldensian community in South America made a critical observation of the Waldensian witness at that point in time. I've slightly modified it this morning by using names from our own community of faith here, but the purpose you will understand. And this is the quote. A church will have to choose between two alternatives. One is to remain exclusively the church of the Benus, Garou, Bartnot, Hans, and other Waldensian families, the church of those who are Waldensian by, by blood ties. Going down this road, the church will become more and more conservative, a museum, a repository of folklore. 
The second alternative is to become the church of those who are Waldensian in spirit, that is, those who profess the faith of the Waldensian church, though they come from, say, Black, Hebner, Smith, Waldrop, and other non-Waldensian families. Taking this road will make the church different from our church in the valleys of Italy, but it will be a living church. Without having read that quote until about six years ago, that was essentially the message that I gave this congregation the very first Sunday that I preached here in the sermon entitled All Together Now on November 4th, 2007. Now don't get me wrong, I am very aware that we are further down the road of this journey of an open path inviting non-Waldensians to the past 12 years. And we have opened our doors and our ministry to non-Waldensians who've come to embrace this church, its ministry, and its unique heritage. But we today are approaching another crossroads and the challenge to embrace the changes before you remain. In a year and a half, Burke County will receive 300 new students at the newly established Morton campus of the North Carolina School of Math and Sciences. That'll mean a couple hundred new staff, teachers, and their families moving in this area. Are you ready to embrace the change that new people and new leadership in this church will bring to our county? Will your doors and your hearts be open to them? Will you make choices that provide welcoming programs to new families and to different ethnic backgrounds? Will you proactively look for ways to serve these people? Considering the choices we've made over the past decade to become a more child, youth, and family-friendly congregation, with our worship and music program for children, considering our educational emphasis and our willingness to serve the needs of those less fortunate in this community, we have been positioning ourselves to be the kind of dynamic and exciting church that will attract new folks, and I believe you will be ready. I've long believed that the soccer camp that we sponsor should be a magnet for new families to the, join the church. And yet so far that has not translated into success in that arena of membership growth. Change can be challenging. It means giving up something familiar to embrace something new. Even for the most hardy soul, one must prepare with two things, a deep breath and prayer. Does change frighten you? If so, I challenge you to look backwards with me a moment, not to return to the past, not to become museum Christians, but to learn from the past and be inspired by it. Consider the changes and challenges in the early years of the Waldensian movement 800 years ago when the Roman Catholic Church excommunicated Waldensian followers as heretics, burning them at the stake. Despite their persecution, God expanded the movement of the Waldensians from the coast of France all the way east to Czechoslovakia, from the north in Germany and Austria, southwards to the southern tip of Italy in the first 200 years. When Waldensians died from the Black Plague of 1629 to 1633, killing hundreds, and also all but two of their pastors, God provided them with French Huguenot pastors to comfort and lead them. When the Waldensians were massacred on Easter Sunday, 1655, it was God who inspired Oliver Cromwell and advocates in eight European Protestant nations to act on their defense and to raise money for the restoration of the Waldensians in their homelands. God provided. 
In the 1680s, when they were jailed, exiled, and killed in record numbers, it was God who raised a soldier pastor named Arnold to lead less than a thousand of them back to their homelands and survive an eight-month siege and the near certain death at the hand of the most powerful army in Europe. And 347 of them survived and escaped in dense fog on a mountaintop to live another day. God did that. It was God who led the settlers of this community in 1893 who initially suffered from several years of near starvation and destitution to find allies in their neighbors and particularly in the Presbyterians in the Charlotte region to give them food and assistance in those trying days. God continues to be faithful to the Waldensian people and to this church. Never doubt God's providential care has led you to this place with the strength of faith and the power of the Holy Spirit to lead you into a positive and joyful future. In each of the cases cited and more, the human response of trust and obedience to God, of perseverance and hard work, of creative thinking, and a willingness to join forces together has brought you through hardship and toil. That same loving God will guide you into the future with courage as you embrace the changes and opportunities of service to God. It'll be up to each of you <clears throat> to open your arms to new neighbors, to tell them the story of this church Invite them to worship. Convey to them your belief in the ministries of this congregation. You are one of the best congregations in this county. As Burke grows with new school, with new school and new businesses and industries that follow, <coughs> opportunities abound for those who follow God. See, I've set before you this day life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God by loving the Lord your God and walking in his ways, then you shall live and become numerous. And the Lord will go, your God will bless you. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us stand and join together as we affirm our faith. We'll be using the Apostles' Creed on page 35 in your hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, and thence he shall come to judge Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the very Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Just goes to show you, I've said that thousands of times, and I made a mistake. Let us with joy offer our gifts of love and gratitude to God.
have blessed us, O God, with many and numerous gifts. We give you back these simple gifts of our lives and our lives themselves, that you may use them to the building of your kingdom and for the sharing of the good news of Christ in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>